Good morning and uh, bless and happy Sabbath to each and every one of us, those that are in the sanctuary here and those of you that are uh, listening. do want to take this opportunity to wish each and every one of us a, a, a blessed Sabbath. And as we begin this morning, as we usually do, I want to share a Sabbath nugget with us. And this one is a very simple one and straightforward. Moses and had just delivered the children of Israel out from Egyptian bondage, and God met with them at Mount Sinai. And the Bible tells us that the Lord came down together to meet with uh, the children of Israel. And in the book of Exodus chapter 19, and it's beginning in verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. So in other words, this was a tremendous scene. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. In other words, we're here looking at a situation where the Lord now appears to Moses in a rather thunderous situation with, with smoke and uh, with fire, the Bible says in a loud voice. But why, why was this so? I want to submit to us this morning it was because that God had wanted the people, the children of Israel, to know the importance of his law. They wanted to remember, wanted them to remember that time that he had given them his law. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter, Exodus rather, chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, we see the law that was given under those circumstances. And I do encourage all of us to go and to read those laws. We call it the Ten Commandments. And that's God's prescription for us as his people. But I particularly want to read uh, Genesis chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And this is what the Bible says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is God speaking to Moses in this thunderous uh, tone and, of course, writing them in fire and tables of stone. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And my dear brothers and sisters, for those of you, as I say each week, that have not been convicted of God's Sabbath and the importance of it, I want you to know that God says, Jesus speaking himself, if you love me, keep my commandments, and his Sabbath is certainly one of his commandments. I pray that God will continue to lead you and guide you to that point where someday, soon and very soon, you would honor him, come completely, draw completely closer to him by keeping his holy and blessed Sabbath day. And indeed, it's a blessing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for your great love and your great mercy towards us. We thank you for preserving and protecting us throughout the past week and bringing us here safely to another blessed and holy Sabbath day. Help us, dear Lord, that as we have entered into this holy time, that you regulate our thoughts, our, our minds, our words, our actions. And help us, dear Father, to only engage in those things that will bring honor and glory to thy name. Help us to recognize the sacredness of your Sabbath and to keep it holy by your grace. Now be with us as we share. Speak to us. 
this morning, dear Lord. May we hear a word from thee, and may hearts be touched, and souls be drawn closer to thee, is my prayer in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen, and amen. Last time we uh, got together, we talked on the subject of the Great Exchange, the Great Exchange Project, and essentially, we talked about the plan of salvation and what Jesus Christ has done for us on Calvary's cross. By taking our place, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus took our place on Calvary's cross so that we would go free. Therefore, the title of the message last week, The Great Exchange. And today I want us to look a, a little deeper into God's Great Exchange project. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, there are many that say that Christ gave his life on Calvary's cross, which he did, and therefore there's nothing left for us to do. Let us just keep on singing and swinging and sinning and celebrating and because Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross we would be just fine but I want you to know this morning as we share that you will discover from God's holy word that that is not what God requires. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, the Bible reads but now thus said the Lord God that created thee, O Jacob, that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by name, thou art mine. And yes, someone would say that God was speaking through Isaiah to the people of Israel. And yes, indeed he was, but we showed last week that the Bible says in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, and verse 29, that if we are of Christ, then are we Abraham's seed, Israel, and heirs according to the promise. So yes, he has redeemed us. He has redeemed us through the blood of Cal through the blood of Jesus Christ, which he shed on Calvary's cross. And as I said, we looked at some of that last week. We looked at the foundation, him giving his life. My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know that because of what Jesus did, we now belong to him. He has purchased us with his own blood. Uh, Peter tells us, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver or gold, from your vain conversation received by your tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so now that Jesus has claimed us, he has bought us, he has created us, we fell from sin, he came, he redeemed us, he purchased us back with his blood, and therefore we now belong to him. And I want you to know that belonging to, to Jesus, there are certain benefits that we enjoy because we have allowed him to come into our lives. He has died for us. The book of Isaiah, again, chapter 43 and verse 2, taking a glimpse at some of those benefits that we get as part of, of being part of the Great Exchange Project. Isaiah writes on behalf of God, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I don't know what is your challenge today. I don't know what life situation that you're facing that seems unconquerable, unmanageable. But I do want to assure you, regardless of what else is besetting you today, 
If you have given your life to Jesus and by doing so, in effect, accepting the Great Exchange Project, I want you to know that God has promised that he will be with you. He says through Isaiah, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Jesus says, and is saying to you today, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh yes, there are benefits. There are benefits to accepting the, the, great, the great exchange project. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm calling it the Great Exchange Project, and that's what it is, because Jesus exchanged his righteousness for our sins. He exchanged our condemnation to death for eternal life. As we read the Bible, we see many concepts that refer to this very, this very principle. Some call it born again, others redeemed. Some, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life or being connected with Christ. Oh yes, certainly, perhaps the most popular of all, the free gift of salvation. Some look at it as being not under the law, under the condition, condemnation of the law, but under grace. My dear brothers and sisters, all that these are saying to us is that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. This idea of accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and he taking our place, I think is demonstrated most profoundly with the thief on the cross at Jesus' crucifixion. The Bible tells us that there were two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. And they were both rallying against Jesus, if thou be the Christ, come down from the cross. Save us and save yourself. But one of those thieves at some point realized that that man that was crucified next to him was none other than the great Messiah, the promised Messiah. And he cried out, to the Lord for forgiveness. He recognized Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when thou shalt come in thy kingdom. And Jesus responded, I say unto you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise, thou wilt be saved. He didn't have the opportunity to come off the cross and to go live a different life, but he accepted Jesus in his heart. But the question this morning, as we begin to look a little deeper into the Great Exchange Project, what about us? What about you and I who are here today? The Bible tells us that this project, this plan, was instituted before we were even created in the book of Revelation 13 and 8. John tells us that who was who would be saved that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life that was slain from the foundations of the earth. I want you to know this morning that unlike the thief on the cross, who had not the opportunity to continue to live, we who do have to cooperate with Jesus Christ in his great plan for the redemption of our souls. My dear brothers and sisters, it's not just accepting him with our lips and doing nothing else. That's not what the Bible teaches. David exclaims in Psalms 119 and 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. So if Jesus Christ exchanged his righteousness 
give me his righteousness for my sin, then it's telling me that he has also empowered me to keep all of his commandments. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul explains to us how this becomes possible in the book of Romans chapter 8, and I'll pick up in verse 3 and 4, Paul writes, For what the law, the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, we can't do it of, of ourselves. The Israelites promised that they would keep it, but they did not. We could promise God that we will, but we cannot in ourselves. But praise God, he has provided a means whereby we can do what he requires. So Paul continues, God sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus came and he took upon us our sinful flesh. The Bible is very clear that he took not the flesh of angels, that he took upon him the seed of Abraham, sinful flesh. And so as he came and he lived in the sinful condition that we are, are living in, the Bible shows us and, and tells us this is the power of the gospel. My brothers and sisters, it's the power of the great exchange. In that what Jesus did through his power we could do. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ lived a life without sin, not because he came down from heaven, but because he was committed to the word of God, because he was committed to do only those things that God says, that he was committed to be righteous. And he is calling you and I this morning to do likewise, because when we accept Jesus, he gives us the very power that he had to keep all of God's commandments and he requires it of us, not in our own strength, but as he dwelleth in us. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face behold as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed from glory to glory even into the, same, into the same image, even from glory to glory. Oh yes, that's why Jesus came, so that we would be made righteous, and righteous means not having sin in our lives. And so Paul continues, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, the spirit the Bible tells us, leads us, and guides us into all truth. But Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and he has given us the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll do exactly the things that Jesus did through the power and the grace that he imparts to us. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to thank God this morning again for the Great Exchange Project. I want to thank God this morning that because of the Great Exchange Project, the plan of salvation, no one has to be lost. No one needs to be deceived. The Apostle Peter tells us in the book of 1 Peter, the second chapter, he says, as also, uh, I'm sorry, the Apostle Peter tells us about the writings, rather, of the Apostle Paul. Uh, because I want to mention this morning that even some of you might be listening have heard people distort the writings of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul telling us that we don't have to keep the law because we are under grace. Paul has said nothing like that. If you find it, please show it to me. He says because we are under grace, we ought to keep the law. But this is what Peter says about the writings of Paul in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood. Maybe you're not quite understanding Paul. 
which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. If you read the Bible, if you read Paul's writings and come to the conclusion and says that Paul says that we don't have to keep the law, then Peter says that you twist in the scriptures to your own destruction besides. How could Paul or any other man tell us that we don't have to keep the law of God? If Paul had said that, I'll, I'll tear every epistle that Paul had written out of my Bible. But he did not say that, and I say, praise God, I want to retain it. My dear brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul lays out the plan of salvation throughout all his writings. But there is one particular passage of scripture I want to share with us this morning that he makes it so plain that even a blind man could see. And it's found in the book of Titus, the book of Titus, the second chapter, and I'll begin in verse 11. Paul writes to the young minister, he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's Calvary, brothers and sisters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What Jesus did on Calvary, the foundation of the great exchange project, the foundation of the plan of salvation. My dear brothers, on Calvary, Jesus gave his sin less life for our sinful souls. Oh, and because of that, many declare so-called pastors and preachers and those that listen to them that because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, that they ought not to live, that they ought not to keep God's law. And then we wonder about the things that are happening in society today. The pastors are responsible because this is what they have told people and continue to tell them. My dear brothers and sisters, it wasn't the law that was nailed to the cross at Jesus' crucifixion. It was not the law that took Jesus to the cross. It was our sins for the wages of sin is death and he paid the price. Why would he want to pay the price? For your sin and my sin and then tell us to go on and keep on sinning. The problem with most in Christendom is that uh, people don't think for themselves. And I'm appealing to you this morning that we begin to think and reason for ourselves. The Bible says come now let's reason together. Why would Jesus want to pay the price for your sin and then tell you that you could go on and keep on sinning? Is that what he told Mary, the woman caught in adultery? My Bible tells me that he told her the book of John as she was brought before him to be stoned, being caught in adultery to go sin no more. And when Jesus gave his life on Calvary, that's exactly what he was saying to you and I. Go sin no more. Go sin the law. Go keep my law. Paul continues in verse 12 of the same chapter, Titus chapter two, and he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Number one, Calvary, salvation made available to all men. We accept it, but then Paul says, we don't go out and, and sin. We go out and we live by God's grace, a righteous life. The same power of grace that forgives us is the same power that gives us the ability to give God, to keep God's law. My dear brothers and sisters, let's reason for a moment. We're still talking today about the Great Exchange Project looking a little deeply into it, looking a little beyond Calvary, if you will. If God's law was done away with at the cross, 
then there could be no sin in the world. Because the Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. So if the law was done away with, then there can't be any sin. Because you could only have sin if there is a law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. My question to you today is, is there sin in the world? Now going beyond that, if there's no law, and there's no sin, then we don't have any need for grace. Because grace is only given for pardon. Pardon to save and, and power to obey. So if there's no law, then there could be no sin. And if there's no sin, then we have no need for grace. Now, if there's no need for grace, then we have no need for a savior. Maybe this is why you hardly hear the gospel being preached on Sunday mornings. Because, again, there's no need for a savior because there's no law. And if there's no law, there's no sin. And if there's no sin, then we have no need for grace. If we have no need for grace, we certainly don't need a savior to give us grace. So let's teach and teach and tell the people about everything else except the Savior who came to save them from their sins. Lord, have mercy this morning upon us all. My brothers and sisters, we're living in a time in our history when we as humanity, what we as humanity need more than anything else is the grace of God to, to keep his law. Look at the condition of society and you're still going to have the God and the audacity to stand up in the pulpit, to put out in social media that we don't have to keep God's law. My dear brothers and sisters, I pray this morning that someone who has indulged in that principle may be enlightened and come to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, not only with their lips, but realize that as we accept him, he gives us the power to live a righteous and holy life. Amen. The angel told Joseph when he discovered that his wife Mary, with whom he had had, had any relationships, was pregnant and he was about to put her away. The angel appeared and told him that he should not do that for she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus and he shall save, the, save us from our sins. Now simple common sense, simple reasoning is telling me if Jesus came to save me from my sin and sin is the transgression of the law then he came to empower me to keep the law. How difficult could that be? My dear brothers and sisters, this is the time in which we live. This is what we ought to be doing, striving by God's grace to obey his law, to become more and more like Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, as we live in this earth today, it was prophesied that this is exactly how it would be. I shared a few weeks ago as it would be in the days of Noah. And we see that the exact same things as it was before the flood is taking place on the earth. Wickedness, unbridled wickedness among men who are supposed to be the highest of God's creation. God is not pleased. And God is not going to put up with it much longer. I don't know how much longer. All I know is that he has called me to tell you this morning that we need to stop sinning. That we need to draw closer to Jesus. We need to be pleading with God like David, search me and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts. And if there is any wickedness in me, lead me to the way of salvation. My dear brothers and sisters, Today 
if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. What is it in your life, in my life, that is contrary to the word of God, that is contrary to his commandments, that we are not doing? I don't know what it is. Each of us individually have our own individual situations to deal with, but this much I know, that we all are in a world of sin, for Paul says that all have sinned, all have sinned, and have come short of the glory of God. Paul tells us as he gives us the third and final plank of the Great Exchange Project, still in the book of Titus, chapter 2 and verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and God willing, next week we'll talk about that. But the plan is basically this. Very simply, as Paul outlines it, we come and we accept Jesus Christ, the free gift of salvation. He forgives us for all sins past. But he does not tell us to go on sinning. We must live godly lives and through his power that we must be righteous, that we must keep his law. And then finally, when he shall come, those that have cooperated with him and that are alive, the Bible tells us that when he comes, that we shall see him as he is, for we will be like him. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, that's the plan. That's the great exchange project. Question is, how do you fit in? What have you been told? What are you doing to make sure, to ensure by God's grace that when Jesus come, you would be one in the company that would look up and to welcome him as your Lord or Savior? He may not come in your lifetime and my lifetime, and yes, maybe he will. The prophecy is appointing that his coming is very soon. And I know when Peter addresses this, he says, you've been hearing this for a long time. But Peter tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. That's why he's delaying, but that all should come into repentance. He's waiting on you this morning to give your life to him and allow you to, to come into his heart and to transform your life so that you would be like him when he comes. The Bible tells us that when God created man in the beginning, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. What is the Bible talking about? God's thoughts are pure. So when he created us, our thoughts were pure. God's actions are ennobling and uplifting. So when he created us, our first parents, their actions were ennobling and uplifting. But then something happened that something came into the picture called sin. Another one came along and told them that they should not believe God because God is basically lying to you. God says to our first parents, thou may eat of the fruit of the trees, of all the, the, uh, uh, the fruit of all the trees in the garden except this one. God gave them the whole garden and says, this one is reserved, don't touch it. But the enemy came along and says that God is lying to you. He knows that if you eat of it, you will become wise, you will become like God's. Go ahead and eat it. You will be just fine, you will be just like God. And then sin entered into the world. And here we are today. The only voice that we need to listen to is the voice of Jesus Christ, our creator. Because he has not only created us, but when we fall, when we fell, he has come and redeemed us with his own uh, uh, precious blood. And so Peter now tells us how we ought to live. And by the way, by the way, just let me throw this in. Death is not another form of life. Death is the opposite of life. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, the lie that 
the enemy told Adam and Eve endures to this day because the people are told that when you die you go up to heaven that's not what the Bible says the Bible says that when you die you go back to the dust of the earth dust thou art and thus thou shalt return the Bible says that death is the opposite of life in the book of Ecclesiastes we are told the living know that they should die but the dead know not anything and in Ecclesiastes the book ninth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes God makes it very clear what the issue of death is he says for the living know that they shall die but the dead know not anything neither have there any more a reward for their memory of them is forgotten talking about death and their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished neither have there any more a portion for anything that is done under the sun but that lie endures and men and women so-called preachers still tell people that when you die you go to heaven but my bible says when you die you go back to the dust because that's what we are dust we only have life because we have God's spirit God breathed into us the breath of life and man became a living soul that's who we are so when we die we cease to exist and this body of dust goes back to the dust from which it came that was a bonus Peter tells us Peter tells us in the book of first Peter chapter 2 for hereunto were ye called because because Christ also suffered for us Calvary leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps he suffered for us so that we would follow in his footsteps now Peter goes on to tell us the example that he has left for us who did no sin neither was God found in his mouth who when he was reviled reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously my dear brothers and sisters the Bible is telling us that when we accept Jesus when we decide to partake in the great exchange project we not only accept Jesus with our lips but we follow his divine example an example of keeping all of God's law Jesus is the epitome of law keeping he had no sin in his life how dare you how dare any man any woman tell you that you could accept Jesus but then you must keep on sinning you can't overcome sin if we can't overcome sin then I need to close up this book every preacher need to close up the church doors and we stop preaching the gospel of course if you're not preaching it you don't have a problem that's the power of the gospel to bring us from sinfulness to sinlessness that's the promise that's why Jesus came that's why he gave his life on Calvary's cross so listen to no man no woman who tells you that in this life we can't overcome sin my Bible tells me when Jesus comes that there are going to be at least 144,000 people some believe it's a literal number some believe it's symbolic whatever it is but my Bible tells me that they would be living a life completely completely without sin we should be striving by God's grace to be putting away sin out of our lives that's our purpose my dear brothers and sisters the Apostle Paul tells us that being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus in other words referring back to Calvary what should happen next who God set forth as a propitiation or a substitute through faith in his blood to declare the righteousness to declare his righteousness 
for the remission of our sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, that's Paul uh, 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 is telling us that. My dear brothers and sisters, when we accept Jesus' sacrifice, we are immediately justified. What I'm talking about is that we must become sanctified. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. John chapter 17 and, and verse 17. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to let you know this morning that the Apostle Paul declares to us in the book of Romans, after he had talked about the plan of salvation and the free gift of grace, and that the law can't save us. He didn't say the law can't, we shouldn't keep the law. It says it can't save us. We don't keep the law to be saved. We keep the law because we are saved. And so Paul continues and he concludes a passage that is so conveniently unavoidable. Paul says, do we then make the law void through faith? God forbid. We uplift, we establish the law. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, if I'm not a Christian and all I'm hearing is that I don't have to keep God's law, then the question that would come to my mind, well then, why do I need to become a Christian if I could just keep on living the way that I live? That's the problem with the world, the Christian world today, is that men and women have been told for generations and generations that you don't have to keep God's law. We've seen the result today in society, the chickens have come home to roost and still, so many have not gotten it, still telling people we don't have to keep God's law. Jesus. Jesus loved to tell parables, and parables were earthly stories with heavenly meanings. In other words, he used the things around people were familiar with to teach them spiritual truths. And in the book of John, chapter 15, he talks about the vine and the branches, and Jesus declared, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. In other words, when we don't bear fruit in Jesus Christ, he cuts us off. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth much more fruit. In other words, as we're striving, as we're making the choices to become more like Jesus, we are empowered through his Holy Spirit, yes indeed, to become more and more like him. It's an ongoing project, it's an ongoing process in the Great Exchange Project, it's called sanctification. My dear brothers and sisters, God has asked me to tell you this morning that he is coming for a people in whose lives there would be no sin. One of the parables that he talked about is found in the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter about the 10 virgins, and I'll just give you a summary. The 10 virgins that were invited to the wedding feast, and the Bible says that five of them were prepared, they filled their lamps with oil. They did not only just accept the invitation, they made the preparation to come to the feast, but the Bible talks of the five foolish who accepted the invitation, but they made no preparation. And the Bible said that the bridegroom delayed his coming. And then suddenly he appeared. But then the five that had oil in their lamps that were prepared. They were welcomed into the marriage feast, but the five that were not, they were cast into everlasting darkness because they did not prepare. You can't accept Calvary 
and I'm not prepared for his second coming by his grace. But because you would find yourself in the same situation like the five foolish virgins. Jesus talked about the parable of the sower and, and the seed. The, some fell on stony ground and some fell among the bushes and the birds came and, and got them and other fell among thorns. The, talking about the trials and tribulations of life but the trials overcame them and they gave up. But then he says that there were some that went through the trials that prepared and they brought forth fruit. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, the word of God is the, it's the seed that is planted into every man's heart. The question is, how are we going to allow that seed to, to manifest in our lives. My dear brothers and sisters in the book of Mark, in the book of Mark, Jesus talking about that same parable we find in Matthew, but I like the way that he concluded in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4 and verse 28, it says, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, those seeds, it says first the blade, you have the seed, then the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn, it grows until it ripens for harvest. The seed just doesn't go in the ground and stay in the ground. If the seed go in the ground and stay in the ground, then we wouldn't have any food to eat. It has to grow and become a plant, produce fruit, vegetables, and so it is with the Christian experience. My dear brothers and sisters, God is telling us today that we must make our calling and election sure. And how we do that is by opening up our hearts to Jesus in the book of Revelation chapter 3 in verse 18. It says Jesus is standing at the door and knock. The question is, are you going to open your heart for him to come in and to transform your life? Or are you just going to believe that, okay, I believe in Jesus? You know, the most famous passage of scripture in the Bible that is known to many, even people that are not Christians, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we take that scripture for granted. But that's a very profound scripture, perhaps the most profound in all of the Bible. It says, for God so loved. It is like the God of omnipotence, the one who spoke and it was done, the one who came from nowhere and took nothing and created everything. It's like he couldn't find the words to describe how much he loves us. But praise God, he demonstrated how he loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My dear brothers and sisters, James tells us in the book of James chapter two, around verses 20, 21, I think it is, that faith without works is dead. Jesus says, if you're going to claim you love me, then keep my commandments. We can't do any better than God. God says he loves us, and he demonstrated his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, the great exchange. So how could we claim that we love him, but then decide that there is nothing for we to do, for us to do, even though he makes it very clear if you love me, keep my commandments. My dear brothers and sisters, we are told, we are told in the book of 2 Corinthians, it says that chapter 5 and verse 21, let me begin in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you are in Christ, then there's going to be a transformation. 
in your life. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And Jesus knows that once you set your foot on that path, that there will be challenges. You may fall. You may, you may slip. But he says, if you would but confess your sins, I would be faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to become new creatures. We have to become more like Jesus. That's the object of the great exchange plan. Paul continues. He says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. How could we be ambassadors for Christ if we're living a life of sin when he lived a sinless life? You know, I just pray that people that call themselves Christians would do a little reasoning, would do a little thinking for themselves. Because if you call yourself a Christian and you're supposed to represent Christ, how could you decide that you don't have to keep his law? How could you decide that you're going to live like the world and do everything like the world does? You're only deceiving yourself. You have to change by God's grace. I'm just telling you what the world says as we look a little deeper into the great exchange, a, a, a project. He says here, uh, where was I? Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray that in Christ's stead we be reconciled unto him. My dear brothers and sisters, Paul, as we begin to wrap this up, he tells us in... Be renewed in the spirit of your mind in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 23 to 25. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, in law keeping, in law abiding, and true holiness. God is holy, God is righteous, and that's what he's called us to be. Be ye holy, even as your Father in heaven is holy. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He that used to steal, let him steal no more. He that used to lie, let him lie no more. He that used to commit fornication, let him commit fornication no more. In the book of Colossians, the same Paul that so many claim says that he tells us that we are under grace so we don't have to keep the law. I hope you've been listening this morning because all Paul is telling us is just through the power of Christ, we must and we are able to, by God's grace, keep his law. And so he says in the book of Colossians, the second chapter and verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. How plain could that be? As we receive Christ, go keep on sinning. Is that what he said? He said, no, we should walk as Christ walked, live as Christ lived. My dear brothers and sisters, my Bible and your Bible, I pray, is very clear that Jesus came and lived a life that lived a life in perfect obedience to his father's law. And he has left it, as I read to us, as an example for us. And so being part of the Great Exchange Project, we are called upon to demonstrate to the world that yes, we could live a life above sin. I know it's tough, but God is able. If God tells me that I could do it, then by his grace, I'm going to at least try, regardless of what men and women say. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 to 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, 
It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I want to make it clear this morning, again, if you haven't heard it before, I'm not talking about keeping law, God's law to be saved. None of us are able to do that. We're talking about keeping God's law because we are saved. Because we are saved. That's why we want to keep his law. Quick scenario as I close. If you have a little child, you have a pool in your yard. You tell your child, your three-year-old or what have you, not to go by the pool because if they do, they're going to fall into the pool and be drowned. But one day that child is, our two and three-year-olds or so, often disobey us. Go near to the pool and he falls in. But you were standing close by. You were watching him all the time. So you run into the pool. And you saved your child. My dear brothers and sisters, does that child now have the permission to go back and to play next to the pool that he would fall in again? Just reason. The answer is no. And so it is with salvation. Jesus saw us sinking in sin. He came and he rescued us. Not that we should continue in sin but that we should stay away from sin. My dear brothers and sisters, as I close this week, as we look a little deeper into the Great Exchange Project, my prayer is that someone would come to realize that salvation involves, salvation involves much more than just saying, I believe in Jesus. It's a dangerous doctrine. It's for one to say that all I have to believe, do is believe and there's nothing else for me to do. It's a dangerous doctrine. My dear brothers and sisters, it's not a doctrine of, of Jesus, but it's a doctrine of devils. Oh yes. Jesus came and gave his life freely, not for me to continue in sin. The same grace that saves us is the same grace that empowers us to, to keep his law. Yes, it's a free gift, but Paul tells us in Ephesians 10 that we're saved unto good works. We're not saved by works, we saved unto good works, and those good works begin with the keeping of God's commandment. And so this morning as we wrap up, I pray that some soul has been edified, someone has been strengthened in their faith, and someone who has never heard words like these would accept them, not because they're my words, but because they're the words of your Savior who came and gave his life for you, who requires that you copy the divine pattern of his life, striving to live a life without sin. And next week, God willing, we talk about the final plank of that great exchange project, the blessed hope. I pray that as you go through this, this week, as you go from day to day, that you would be conscious of the fact that if you may call, if you claim the name of Jesus, that you would represent him to the rest of the world. The world is in darkness, and they need to see the light of Jesus Christ. They can't see the light of Jesus Christ if his followers have decided that they're not going to obey him. May God bless you and, and keep you. And yes, part of that obedience is keeping his seventh day Sabbath. It is part of his moral law. And no, it wasn't nailed to the cross. He is still my creator. My creator who spoke and it was done, who commanded and it stood fast is my Redeemer who gave his life on Calvary's cross. He's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. And he has given me his Sabbath commandment so that I would remember truly who he is, my creator, my sustainer, my redeemer. I pray this morning that as the word has been spoken, yea, even through this worthless piece of clay, that it would find residence in some heart and that someone, someone if you never have, give your life to Jesus, it would be the, the greatest decision that you would ever make. And if you have purpose in your heart to do the things that he says and to follow him as he walked in perfect obedience to his law. Father, we thank you once again. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together in your house of worship. And yes, come together into your holy cathedral of time, your blessed and holy Sabbath day. Pray that the words that were spoken today, dear Lord, that for the words that you require me to speak, that hearts would be touched and men would be drawn closer to thee. Now be with us as we continue our day, remembering that this is your Sabbath day to keep it holy. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Uh, <laughs>